The social contract. A lot is being said about this, and weirdly, it's a lot of it's being said within the gaming community, but I don't think a lot of people who are invoking the social contract actually understand <laughs> what they're talking about. Uh, now, most famously, the social contract is, is perhaps talked about in Hobbes's Leviathan. Uh, so to keep the, the thematic theme going, I, I guess, we, in terms of gaming, we should call our social contract Tiamat just to keep that all going but the idea is basically that when we engage with society when we engage with with government and so on we are entering into a social contract that can be explicit like a, a constitution or a written agreement you know that that sort of thing implicit in that these are the kind of unwritten unspoken assumptions of behavior between each other and hypothetical, meaning future possible adjustments or changes to the social contract. You know, the capacity to make we usually delegate to somebody by offering up our, our vote or you know, our continued obedience, whatever the case might be. Now, libertarians are probably already going, Durr, durr, I didn't sign nothing, durr. That's not the nature <laughs> of a social contract. By participating in society, you sign up to a social contract, uh, but it's give and take, right? You you give up perhaps a, a certain amount of freedom, and you receive in exchange for that certain amounts of security or assistance or whatever else it might be. It's a whole cost benefit thing. It, it's it's horse trading. So, an an explicit social contract might be something like the the U.S. Constitution. The implicit one might be the agreement to abide by the rules when you sit down to play a game uh, and the hypothetical might be the way in which we delegate to politicians to create new laws and so on that govern our social contract but it's always horse trading it's always give and take like you might feel a sting when you pay your taxes right but those taxes go into things like public health care policing public projects you know, to, to, to one extent or another, we trust the people that we delegate to spend this money in a wise way to improve society as a whole. So there is a certain amount of enlightened self-interest involved. You know, we give up certain things because the benefits outweigh the penalties, or ideally they should. And when these social contracts are, are broken, if politically they're broken, then you might vote out the incumbents or have a revolution or whatever. When there's an implicit social contract then you know someone breaks the rules while you're playing monopoly i right? know you you reprimand them you penalize them you you socially ostracize them <laughs> whatever it might be for breaking those implicit rules and the hypotheticals kind of kind of goes back to the first one because you tend to be delegating authority when you want changes so that, that pretty much covers the basics i think that there is this give and take that you're accepting discomfort in exchange for more positives the negatives and so on. So how does this apply to gaming? Now, obviously, this has primarily been coming up lately in regard to these consent documents. Uh, but I felt that while I'm sort of not doing any more videos on that <laughs> necessarily, this was interesting enough to do a separate video on. So what is the social contract when you sit down to play a role playing game? Now you're entering into an agreement with the other players to play through a story together, to abide by the rules, and so on, and to a certain extent, depending on the game, to defer to the authority of the games master to tell the story and to apply the rules evenly and fairly, and even to modify the rules, so there's that hypothetical part, to create house rules where there's general agreement that that's the way to go a certain rule is stupid or doesn't work or or whatever else so your games master is kind of like your at the very least your chairman um, and your your delegate your representative and sort of carries carries the the sway the the it breaks ties if it comes to votes not that most groups do anything so explicit as votes when <laughs> when they're deciding what they're doing when they're playing so you're entering into that agreement with the games master who who, who carries, carries the vote if there's a tie essentially 
uh, in very crude terms, and with the other players. So you're giving up certain amounts of control over your character, because they will be interpreted by the rules which we all agreed to uh, abide by in the decisions of the Games Master. And in reference to this stuff, you know, you may feel a little bit of discomfort from time to time with whatever topics or, or whatever else it might be that is explored in the game, but you receive things that you enjoy in exchange, and you're also considering everyone else's joy in the game, their their enjoyment of whatever topics or whatever, and on balance, the good will outweigh the bad. Right? So that's that's the social contract. You give up certain things, you endure certain things for the good of the whole, and for the future good of yourself. Because if even if you do experience a moment of discomfort, there'll be something else along that you enjoy, and what you enjoy might discomfort somebody else. Well, let's turn this into something more of a kind of um, explicit calculus, shall we? So here's a table. All right, you've got uh, a whole bunch of players all lined up, and the games master is at the top and given a slightly bigger section to represent the greater importance of the role of the games master in the vast and overwhelming majority of role-playing games. So you're playing a campaign, a, lo a long campaign, and then there's this adventure, and the Games Master introduces a spider-themed temple. Maybe it's Dark Elves or, or whatever else. The Games Master has put in the work, right, and they have the delegated authority of the group to decide on the stories and the rules and everything, and they really enjoy it. One of the players really doesn't like spiders. Two of the spi uh, two, of the, two of the spiders. Two of the players are kind of neutral on the matter, and then the the rest are really happy and have been looking forward to this because they like these kind of themes and dark elves or or whatever else. So what what should we do? One player really doesn't like these. What does the social contract tell us about this? Well, more people enjoy it more people are going to act, extract fun from this than are going to be distressed or upset. And this is part of a campaign. There's a whole lot of games in the future, many of which might be things that that one player would enjoy. So what, what can this tell us? Well, measured against future personal enjoyment and the enjoyment of the rest of the group, then I think we can see that they should, ideally, just suck it up and take it. And if they can't, they should withdraw themselves from the social contract by departing the group. See, the problem with these meta rules around content and so on is that they empower a single individual to be authoritarian over the group to violate the social contract that exists. The good of the other players at the table, the future good of the group as a whole. They empower that single individual to be an authoritarian, even though they have no legitimacy upon which to base that authority, unlike the Games Master. Of course, a counter-argument to this might be that the social contract can be changed. You can agree as a group that you are going to implement these rules. And that would be a useful uh, counter-argument and that would allow your group to set their autonomy and their own social contract. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. We already have conventions saying that they're going to bring in these, these tools. And for a lot of groups, arguably for most people, and for bigger concerns like genre emulation, uh, creating the, the fitting mood, and so on, at the table, and so on, uh, this can be a detrimental and you haven't entered into a social contract with the convention organizers and so on, they have unilateral power to do these sorts of things. They, by and large, don't consult with the people that are going to be <laughs> attending on these things, they just do them. And so, you know, the only option you have is to really withdraw yourself. But then we have a problem in that the bigger conventions have a de facto monopoly in a lot of ways. So it's all very complicated, but there is the local social contract level and so on, which is where this violation occurs. 
and it's an abuse of authority to try and dictate that these rules must be applied in individual groups when those groups don't want them to. But you can't excuse this kind of thing, you can't excuse this any more than you can someone cheating on their character creation, dice, dice rolls or whatever because they, they want to because it makes them more comfortable. This kind of thing is as much for violation of the unspoken social contract in gaming groups as that, as, as cheating. Uh, it's, not, it's not a good development. There's more to be said about this, particularly the comparisons with BDSM, which are entirely facile, in my opinion, <laughs> as, as someone who's into that as well as gaming. Uh, perhaps I'll do something on that in the future, but otherwise um, I prefer to lay this to rest. But the, the main point to take away here is that this isn't a fulfillment of a social contract. It's the empowerment to destroy the social contract. And that's why you get such a strong reaction to it in exactly the same way as we react strongly to cheats. The same way that monkeys react strongly to cheats. It's, a, it's just a total violation of our evolved survival reflex. And that's what you have to, to keep in mind. People are outraged because cheating is, being, is something that outrages us because it has negative survival utility. Zang. Subconscious. You say it. You even think it. He had had it. 